right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezra uh, and chapter 6 this evening. Ezra chapter 6. We're going to look at the first five verses of this chapter. So let's begin by reading Ezra 6, verses 1 through 5. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. <clears throat> and there was found at Akmatha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. Now he's going to begin to quote. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Quote, let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits, and the breadth thereof three score cubits, with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. And also let the golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon, be restored and brought again unto the temple, which is at Jerusalem, every one to his place, and place them in the house of God. The narrative is now back in the capital of the kingdom in Babylon. And as we mentioned before, uh, the kingdom of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar ruled over was overtaken by the Mede kingdom and the Persian empire during the time of Israel's captivity. And here one king, Darius, makes an inquiry about a previous king's, Cyrus, decree concerning the temple uh, at Jerusalem which all the Jews' enemies are so upset about and which they are opposed to. Um, here in verse 1, you'll notice the first mention uh, in Scripture of a library. It's called the House of the Rolls. And actually, uh, uh, well, indicating rolled up scrolls, undoubtedly. And this would predate the famous library in Alexandria, Egypt, which uh, hadn't been built yet at that time, or established at that time, which is renowned in the ancient world. And uh, the record of Cyrus' decree is found, which is partly recorded for us here, but go back, if you will, to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles and chapter 36. And the last two verses, verses 22 and 23, they say, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. It's interesting that that is the last text to be found in the Hebrew scriptures, in, the, in a Jewish arrangement of scriptures. They had the same 39 books in the in their scriptures that we have in our Old Testament. They're simply arranged in a different order, and they conclude with a command to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. And it's going to find a greater fulfillment. It's finding fulfillment even today, now that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel, once again. And great, uh, great uh, jubilation took place earlier this year as the United States recognized Israel, uh, rather the city of Jerusalem, as its capital. Now, to be truthful, I haven't heard in the, in, anywhere in the news that the state of Israel made Jerusalem its official capital because for so long Tel Aviv has been its 
official, quote-unquote, capital. Maybe you've heard something that I have missed in the news. But we recognized Jerusalem as Israel's proper capital and moved our embassy there and, you know, ribbon-cutting ceremonies and all of that. And uh, they're certainly enamored with our president. At least uh, Jews in Israel are very pleased with our president right now. Jews in America, not so much. And I heard someone describing on the radio yesterday, there seemed to be a, when you live there in Israel as a Jew, you, you are confronted every day, everywhere you go, with the historic importance of that city, the, the historic importance of that place, that part of the world, to the Jewish people themselves. Here in America, you may have a Jewish name and a Jewish background or your family's history of religion might have been Jewish, but uh, you don't live there. And so you get caught up here in America with all of the civil rights and the you know, gay, lesbian uh, uh, rabbis performing wedding ceremonies, same-sex wedding ceremonies and so forth. And uh, you're more comfortable with atheists as your best friends than you are with devout, observant Jews. And uh, so they, they buy the party line about liberalism and go through life uh, seeking money for themselves and um, feeling good by promoting social justice or whatever they want to call it. There's no such thing as social justice. It's either justice or there's injustice. Putting some modifier or some adjective, social justice, what does that mean? If you're, if you're a homosexual or queer and someone robs you, the effect is the same. You've been robbed, just like somebody who's not a, not a queer. You're robbed. And uh, if you can find the person, they should be punished. The idea that there's this special category based upon your feelings, or based upon what you identify as or think you are today, uh, that, that's com completely unnecessary. shouldn't even be part of the discussion. But um, here is part of the decree Cyrus made that is that the Jews should return and build their temple. Now, some time has elapsed, and Darius is the king, and he was unaware of that previous decree. And the Jews' enemies in Israel are trying to take advantage of that and uh, complain to Darius, the next king of the Persian Empire, that uh, he halt their, their construction project. But um, notice back in our text tonight, Cyrus um, intended to expand the breadth of the temple from 20 cubits, as it was in Solomon's time, that is the, the width of the building that you entered in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 6, which we won't turn to, uh, to now 60 cubits, as verse 3 mentions. And the year 536 B.C. is commonly given as the date or the year when the foundation was begun to be re relayed, uh, April of that year to be precise, and completed by September of the same year. About five months later, the foundation was uh, relayed. And uh, they say that it was completed in 515 B.C., which would make a 21-year construction project for the new, for the uh, rebuilt temple. Verse 3 in our text, you see Cyrus' words that say, let the house be builded. Now that, now, now turn if you will to the forward to the little book of Haggai, the little book of the prophet Haggai, near the end of the Old Testament. Haggai. And look there at Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, jump down to verses 7 and 8, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. 
and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, look also at chapter 2 and verses 6 through 9. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And verses 20 through 23. And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of the excuse me, the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I Take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I excuse me, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. The prophet Haggai takes the whole enterprise of rebuilding the temple, and he applies it to a future time, sometime beyond where we are right now in 2018 A.D., uh, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has in, in view, in his vision. Although he's commanding them to build right now, he's going to see it uh, refulfilled in the future in a much greater temple uh, wherein Christ sits to rule the nations. This is what we call double application of the scriptures. And um, there's a double application, for example, in Elijah being returning before the great day of the Lord, but also being fulfilled in John the Baptist. And Matthew 11, about verses 13 and 14, it says, For the prophets and the law prophesied until John, um, meaning John the Baptist, and Christ said, And if you will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. And if they, if they, if the Jews as a nation would turn, had turned to Jesus Christ, he was ready to establish the kingdom and begin reigning uh, right then and there. But, uh, and John the Baptist then would have fulfilled the role of Elijah coming right before the second coming of the Lord, returning just before the second coming of Christ. But they didn't, and so he wasn't. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, you see the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation, undoubtedly Elijah and Moses, uh, which are going to make a, another reappearance uh, and get their heads cut off right before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea 1 and verse 10, you don't need to turn, but it says there, In the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God referring to backslidden Israel being restored to their land yet again. And as I said, we see that taking place even today. And yet Paul uh, invokes that scripture. He uses it to describe the Gentiles being converted to God and the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 9, verse 26. And the double application is found time and again throughout the Bible. Uh, if for no better reason, I think, than to test the faithfulness and the obedience of the one who's reading it rather than criticizing it or sitting in judgment of the scriptures. I think there's a lot of things in the Bible that God put there to see how much you're going to believe that this book is the word of God, even if you don't comprehend every facet of every verse right away. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, I think the first chapter, blessed is he that readeth and he that heareth the words of this prophecy. doesn't say there's a uh, blessed is he that understandeth everything. But if you read it and um, without questioning it, 
Uh, God will begin to reveal the scriptures to you little by little. And um, also, uh, Luke 2.14 announced, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And yet none of that happened when it was first proclaimed, did it? We're still waiting for God to finally get all the glory in the highest and for there to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. There's very little of it right now at all. And uh, we're waiting for it, but, and Christ is going to certainly bring it, but uh, the angels proclaimed it nevertheless. Now, um, I want you to also notice the phrase in verse 4. It says, And let the expenses be given out of the king's house. There you have a church and state joined together. Tax money is going to be used to support religion. And uh, what a wonderful proof text the Catholic Church could use to justify the state of the Vatican or Vatican City. The Vatican, or the, I'm not sure the exact title. I used to know it, now I've suddenly forgotten it. I think it's the, the, I think it's the state of Vatican City is the, the official name. But the city of the Vatican City, uh, within the city limits of Rome, Italy, on 100 acres, is an official state. It is a completely independent relig uh, state or government within, uh, of the world. It's the smallest uh, official country, according to Guinness World Record people, in the world. Like I say, only on about 100 acres. And yet they have a branch office in virtually every part of the world. <laughs> And um, and here's a, I'll throw this in, we'll move along real quickly, but let me throw this thought out to you. Since the Vatican is the headquarters of religion and also an official government capital, there's no disentangling them. They are one and the same. But since that's the case, it means that Every baptized Roman Catholic is also a citizen of a foreign country. He might not even be aware, he might not even realize what that means when he got baptized as a member of the Catholic Church. He also received citizenship at Vatican City. I, uh, in my job at the funeral home, I had a priest, several priests ride with me. And um, I conducted sort of an informal interview, an unofficial interview with him, uh, or survey, I should say, in the past. And um, I've asked a number of them that question. Doesn't that mean every Catholic is a, an official citizen of Vatican City? And uh, two or three priests said, well, one said, well, no, they, they don't live there. And I said, I realize they don't live there, but there are a lot of Americans who don't live in the U.S., but they still have American citizenship. He said, well, I just don't think that would work. And uh, another Irish priest, he said, well, no. So well, why not? Well, ju just because. And uh, a priest who was, who was visiting here in the U.S. for about six months from uh, Nigeria, I asked him, no, no, no. And he wasn't sure of the question. But then another priest from the Philippines who was here Temporarily, uh, he was riding in the car with me, and I asked him that same question. And he, without hesitation, said, yes. All records of all baptisms, all marriage records are all sent to the Vatican, ultimately, and kept there. That way, the Vatican has an idea of where their members live throughout the world. And uh, that it can then decide where they need to put more money for f charity and r relief aid and so forth. So he confirmed my suspicion. Now, my Having said all that, that means that every parish priest, every monk in a, in a Catholic monastery or some Catholic order, every Catholic nun, every Catholic bishop, every Catholic cardinal throughout the world is also an agent of a foreign government. They may live here, they may work here, they may pay taxes here. They pay taxes, they may be exempt from paying taxes. But 
They might have been born here and raised here, but as an official employee of the Roman Catholic Church, they are a, an agent of a foreign government. Now, what do foreign uh, representatives, what do, what, does our, what do our ambassadors serving the United States in other countries uh, if they should break the law, or what, if their kids should go out and break the law, uh, what do they enjoy to keep their kids from going to prison? Diplomatic immunity. And I, I have no way of proving it because these negotiations, these closed-door meetings, the settlements between pedophile priests and their victims are kept hush-hush. And uh, only when it's necessary, for the, it's unavoidable, the public learns how much the Catholic Church has spent uh, settling these lawsuits. The L.A. Archdiocese had to pay $660 million settling uh, claims against uh, priests for pedophilia and child abuse for decades. And the Archdiocese of Boston, Massachusetts, much more than that, over nearly a billion dollars to settle lawsuits against them going back decades. In fact, so much so the Catholic Archdiocese had to sell some of their Catholic schools, close down some of the Catholic schools and reship students to other schools or close down um, nunneries and one or two monasteries to, to pay the bill that they were ordered to pay. And uh, only when it's so far out of hand that they can't control it anymore, they can't spin it any other way, do the priests ever end up having to go to prison. It just sure seems that way when you watch the news and read the news stories. They want to control it and, and deal with the problem within in-house and deal with it themselves. But I've often wondered if diplomatic immunity isn't invoked to protect priests from going to prison for a lot of their child abuse problems. And um, I, I would love to see if that's ever been researched and find out what someone has found. But let's go back to our text. Church, state, set up with a great, great text there, verse 4, for the Catholic Church or, you know, German Lutherans or Scotch Presbyterians or British the Church of England, people who love state churches. Um, look at chapter 7. Just across the page, verse 24. Or rather, yes, chapter 7, verse 24. It says there, And we certify you that touching any of the priests, and this is a, this is a decree sent to um, the builders of the temple. This is the order sent by the next king, Artaxerxes, to continue it, and adding a few uh, rules, adding a few protections to, the, to their building. Verse 24, And we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. There's uh, no taxation of the clergy or the priest, etc., uh, of that particular system, that religious system, which is not fair in a society like the one in which we live. Notice uh, verse 25. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. There the, the church now has control of judges and the judicial system, the courts. And um, I don't want... Um, Islamic law, or what they call Sharia, impose, uh, enacted here in the United States anywhere, and it shouldn't be enacted in any country that's not uh, controlled by Islam, but that's uh, Islam, and I don't, nor do I want the, um, the Roman Catholic Church to decide which laws uh, are going to be enforced and made, benefiting them uh, to the disadvantage of anyone else. I think the system that we live under, that God, 
I believe God motivated and inspired many of our founding fathers to, to build or to create a system which would give as much uh, a liberty to the exercise of people's faith and religion uh, as possible without being told what they can believe, what they can't believe, or what they have to do, and which observance they have to recognize, and so forth. You know, when the founders of this country established the United States and all of its operations and functions, and the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, or an establishment of religion, it was a, a system of plurality at the time. They believed in plurality of religions. Everyone should have an equal uh, opportunity to express his or her faith. At the time, however, just about everybody was a member of some Protestant sect, some Protestant denomination. Roman Catholicism was looked at n in a negative light, and they wanted as few Catholics coming here and setting up roots as possible. They were trying to get away from systems that persecuted Protestants and burned them at the stake centuries before in Europe. They're trying to get away from that. And the idea that, uh, or, that or the idea that, that Jews would spring up and take over things, that was not considered, conceived of either. And um, Islam played no part in establishing the United States. And for that matter, neither did, neither did uh, Judaism nor did Roman Catholicism. This was considered a Protestant nation. And so when they talked about plurality, they meant a, a plurality of, of Christian denominations. Obviously, if someone who's not a, a Christian and is not a true believer of Christ lives here, do you know that the, the, um, every state has their own constitution and the preamble in virtually all 50 states recognizes God or in the name of God we do declare the state constitution and this so forth. I think Vermont actually went farther than simply saying invoking God. They actually said uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ in their original state constitution. Of course, in my thinking, that would mean that the entire country was not intended to allow atheism to spring up here or the atheists to have liberty here. They didn't want them. They didn't need them. They were contrary to the virtues they tried to teach uh, from the Bible. You know, the old McGuffey readers and the school textbooks that cited the Bible as a source and would teach kids Christian text, Christian lessons, the Ten Commandments, in public schools. Now, you don't even mention the word Bible and somehow you're a, a narrow-minded bigot if you even mention it. But here they've got tax exemption for the um, priests and the clergy, um, a state church set up, and a control of the court system and the judges. That is not what the uh, American system was intended, nor, I, nor can I see that God uh, ever sanctioned such a, a system. Verse 26, chapter 7, verse 26. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. So now your church can imprison anyone or uh, uh, take away their private property and even execute someone who's not a Catholic or is anti-Islam or anti-anything else. And uh, we had a missionary not long ago who's looking to go to the Ukraine, and he was showing us his missionary slides and describing how the, the uh, Greek Orthodox Church there, the Russian Orthodox Church there, tries to badmouth Baptists or any outside denomination because they have a control over the people's lives, and they've had it very comfortable there for a long time, and they don't want anything upsetting it uh, certainly, they don't want people reading the scriptures for themselves. Um, that's why Islam and Catholicism love the idea of state church or the one church controlling the entire governmental functions. And lastly, I want you to notice in our text, Exodus 6, verse 5, 
you see all the stolen vessels being returned. He says, let all the golden and silver vessels of the house of God uh, and so forth be returned. And um, Jeremiah, and we won't read it for time's sake, Jeremiah chapter 27 and verses 16 to 22, if you want to write that down, he predicted that all of those things would not be returned to Jerusalem until after their 70-year captivity. And he said, don't believe any prophet that says it's going to be is going to end soon and we'll go back to Jerusalem and everything will go back to normal. Jeremiah said, that prophet is not sent by God. And he said, you're going to be in, in uh, captivity for 70 years. And after 70 years, then you'll come back and all of those vessels, all of that, those items, the, 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 the labor that the priest would lean over and wash their hands and feet in before they do the sacrifices, um, the altar, everything else that was made there would all be uh, torn apart and, and taken as a stolen treasure to the Babylonians, and it would be 70 years before those things would be returned and restored back to Jerusalem, and the rebuilding of the temple would take place. You know, God's prophets are so, even even prophesying concerning small details like the vessels and the silver and the gold uh, thing, uh, in, instruments used in the service of the tabernacle and the temple, rather. Even prophesying concerning what we might consider minor details, uh, they're so far ahead of any other false prophet like Joseph Smith and the Mormons or or any of their prophets, uh, or Muhammad. Um, Muhammad never predicted anything that could then come true after he died. Not at all. They call him a prophet, but not in the sense of being able to predict the future. He wasn't a prophet at all. 